Plo Koon, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Shock T, the hero of the Stark Hyperspace War, the Negotiator, and Guardian of the Temple. And Kiadi Mundi, Anakin Skywalker, and Kit Fisto, the champion of Hypori, the hero with no fear, and the savior of Mon Calamari. Well, we're finally here, friends. Plo Koon, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Shock T versus Kiadi Mundi, Anakin Skywalker, and Kit Fisto. The collaborative team battle finale to Versus Series Season 6 that I announced a year ago. Oh dear. I am very, very, very sorry for the delay of this one, guys. The release of this matchup was hampered by a number of external production and social factors that me, Callan, and Connor were honestly not expecting to encounter. Starting with the production side of things was scheduling. Given that the Western US, the Central UK, and Eastern Canada don't share time zones, scripting sessions weren't always easy to arrange. There were days when me and Connor were available, but Callan wasn't. Days where Callan and Connor were available, but I wasn't. You get the idea. Even when we could all find the time to meet up, the actual writing wasn't always a smooth process. You know that old saying, too many cooks in the kitchen spoil the broth? Yeah, that was pretty accurate when it came to us. While we all agreed on which Jedi team would win and why, we all had different ideas of how those concepts should be presented in the video. Add that to the fact that we're all stubborn as hell, and I think you can see the conflict. Things got so muddled, in fact, that we actually had to completely rewrite the 13,000 word script a total of three times before finally settling on a version we could all somewhat agree on. The decision of who would be the primary editor of the matchup was also a bit of a hurdle. Our original plan was to have each of us edit our individual breakdowns, then have Callan be the one to edit the verdicts, since editing is his specialty. However, due to reasons I will cover shortly, Callan was only able to record his audio, and the job of head editor fell to me. This is why mine and Callan's breakdowns will share a similar visual style, while Connor's will be unique. I know that might be a bit jarring for some, but it's better than the alternative. The alternative in this case being scrapping the entire thing. Which nobody wanted. At all. Moving into the social factors, this past year has been a bit of a roller coaster for all of us. I've been struggling with the living and familial issues I mentioned in my last channel update video, while Connor has been having several crazy shakeups at his workplace. As for Callan, he was sidelined by my visit to his country, as well as the unfortunate hospitalization of a few family members. So, yeah, it's not like we've been putting this off for nothing. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to address the layout of this matchup. As this is a team battle and not a 1v1, our verdicts are going to have a slightly stronger emphasis on skill and technical factors as opposed to the even three-way combo of skills, technicals, and feats we usually employ. This isn't to say that feats will be disregarded, nor is it to say that if you took these two teams and only compared feats, the verdict would change. It wouldn't. We just feel that placing a stronger emphasis on skill is more becoming of a 3v3 matchup. With all that out of the way, let's get started.
All six combatants were notable for having survived the end of the Clone Wars, a three-year physical grind that pushed all to their limits. Each owed their survival to different strengths, both physical and mental, following different paths through the storm. They do share similarities, however. Kiadi Mundi, Anakin Skywalker, and Kit Fisto were renowned frontline commanders, directly leveraging their training and hardiness to blaze a path to victory. Each of the three boasted unique training backgrounds, joining the Order under radically different circumstances. But all were noted combatants, true hammers of the Jedi. Kiadi Mundi was a 73-year-old Syrian male. Syrians were distinguished by their elongated craniums which contained two brains and an extra heart. Their twin brains made them excellent conceptual thinkers, allowing them to examine issues from multiple points of view or contemplate several ideas simultaneously. Force-sensitive Syrians were noted for their precognitive gifts. However, the weight of their massive skulls left the otherwise humanoid Syrians with chronic back problems, and conflicting input from two brains left many with poor reflexes and coordination. Despite his age, Kiadi Mundi was extremely fit, boasting an athletic muscular physique. As a combatant, he demonstrated a balanced mixture of attributes, leveraging his dexterity through complex blade work and his agility through acrobatic maneuvering. However, his fighting style was primarily defined by his stalwart strength and grounded postures, focused on maintaining a measured offensive advance. Mundi's performance levels were backed up by his exceptional hardiness and tolerance for pain. On Tatooine, he survived an ambush by Jabba's thugs and a subsequent skiff crash in the desert, coming away with just a broken collarbone. Though he repaired the worst of the damage with the Force, he had to endure the pain for several days afterwards. On Hypori, he survived the extended infantry engagement and managed to power through his exhaustion and put up a fight against Grievous. However, Mundi was not without his shortcomings. His combat performance was predicated on his composure, so whenever he was distracted or otherwise off-balanced, he effectively fell apart. A 22-year-old human male, Anakin Skywalker was an exceptional though otherwise typical example of his species. Having spent his childhood as a slave on the harsh desert world of Tatooine, Anakin entered the Jedi Order already prepared for the laborious and physically active lifestyle of a knight. At the height of his physical prime, Anakin stood at a towering six foot two and boasted a powerful athletic build. A veteran physical combatant, he took his fair share of hits in battle, specifically distinguished by facial dueling scars inflicted by the Dark Jedi Asajj Ventress and a prosthetic right arm, the legacy of his first duel with Count Dooku. The prosthetic provided superhuman grip strength, an advantage that Anakin has leveraged in close combat on multiple occasions. In regards to his baseline physical capabilities, his performance levels were nothing less than Olympian. He leveraged his dexterity through high-speed lightsaber combat, while the physical strength behind his blows was compared to a meteor strike, and supplemented these traits with his exceptional agility, which allowed him to keep pace with evasive adversaries. This high level of physical output was reinforced by his exceptional stamina and resiliency, which he demonstrated on multiple occasions. He survived the arena massacre on Geonosis, endured Dooku's Force Lightning, and went on to battle the Master Swordsman almost to a draw. Against Asajj Ventress on Yavin 4, he endured her telekinetic pummeling, digging deep and ultimately overpowering her. The mere fact that he survived his catastrophic defeat on Mustafar was a testament to his sheer hardiness and will. A Nautilan male, K. 
Kit Fisto was in his late 30s to early 40s. Though aside from his force sensitivity, there was very little to distinguish him from typical members of his species. Native to the ocean world of Glee and some, Nautilans were a race of amphibious humanoids noted for possessing quicker reflexes and a moderately higher constitution compared to humans. In regards to durability, Fisto was an exceptional specimen, having shrugged off a slash to the abdomen by the bounty hunter Dirge and even surviving singes by a flamethrower to his head. Nautilans were further distinguished from other aquatic species by their unique ability to survive in both undersea and land-based environments for an indefinite period of time, as well as their generally green-hued complexion, low-level night vision, and an assemblage of head tentacles protruding from the back of their scalps. As noted in the new Essential Guide to Alien Species, these tentacles were sensory organs that granted them the ability to read the emotional state of those in their vicinity by attuning themselves to the pheromone levels of a desired sentient. The benefits of these growths even extended into Kit's ability to function on land, as they would enhance his baseline senses, such as smell and touch, to help his body adjust to the foreign environment. Strength, Speed, Dexterity The three combatants are defined by their exceptional physical performance levels and their exceptional hardiness, their success owing to their common ability to soldier on in the face of staunch adversity. All three combatants demonstrated a similar mixture of strength, agility, and dexterity, their different areas of excellence neatly complementing one another. While Anakin is physically the strongest of the three and Kit the fastest, none of the three outmatches the other in any category. Each is a quintessential example of a Jedi's physical fitness and can trust in their companions to share the load. In contrast to their opponents, Plo Koon, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Shark T shared the same training background. Recruited into the Order at a young age, 10 years training as initiates, and another 10 as Padawans, before being knighted. The differences between these three are generational and biological, each being a different age and species. The disparity between their performance much greater than that of the more unified Kianakit. As a member of the Keldor species, Plo Koon was naturally granted greater than average reflexes and endurance, average being the peak human level of these traits, and was noted for his physical strength. Natural resilience to environmental extremes is also common to a Keldor, and Koon has taken full advantage of this fact. Keldor constitution, however, is weaker than that of humans, and has caused Koon severe issues in the past, this factor worsened by his advanced age. Despite his advanced years, Koon remains incredibly fit and has survived extended periods on the battlefield without tiring. He is also quite nimble for such a grounded duelist, capable of incredible feats of acrobatics with the aid of the Force. Kuhn's mentally oriented abilities through the Force are naturally bolstered by his species sensory glands that grant even non-Force sensitives among his kind basic telepathy, and have allowed him to fine-tune his mental Force skills to a level typically unattainable by most of his contemporaries. This is particularly useful to him when acting in consort with other Keldor, even more so with those he has a bond with, as with his niece. Keldor physiology also burdens Kuhn with a serious disadvantage in the form of his anti-ox breathing mask, which he needs to breathe in oxygen-rich environments due to his species evolution in Doran's helium-intensive atmosphere. This weakness almost resulted in Kuhn's death when Savage Press managed to rip his mask from his face during their duel after Plo became distracted trying to warn an ally of an unfortunately fatal mistake. A human male who stood just under six feet tall, Obi-Wan was roughly in his mid to late thirties and was still well into his physical prime. Slim but muscular, he possessed extremely high levels of speed, agility, and stamina, capable of fighting non-stop for hours on end. His strength, while perhaps not too far above the standard for Jedi Masters of his caliber, was considerable, having shattered the armor plating of battle droids with the force of his blows and sustaining blade locks with multiple high-caliber adversaries. 
However, as impressive as some of those feats were, Kenobi's durability was on a whole other level. He has survived being shot, impaled by shards of glass, burned with a lightsaber, blown up, gassed, crushed by dirge, and has even fought his way through up to 30 Ratataki guards and Asajj Ventress, following months of agonizing Sith torture, during which time he was deprived of sleep, forced to wear a mask that dulled his senses and kept him from calling on the Force to sustain himself, along with having maggots feasting on his innards. Wow. Shak T is a Togruta, and enjoys many advantages over her contemporaries as a result of this. Togrutans are naturally more resilient than humans, which, backed up by her force enhancement, makes Shak T not quite a tank along the lines of Malgus or Vader, but definitely an armored truck like Kenobi when it comes to taking physical punishment. She has survived being buried alive beneath rubble, has worked through a laser shot to the abdomen, and has repeatedly shrugged off electrical shocks to the wrist and hands by electrostaffs. On top of this physical hardiness, a Togruton's montrals allow for a passive form of echolocation. This gives T a heightened awareness of her surroundings that, enhanced by her force sensitivity, effectively gives her a sphere of vision. The extent of this sight's clarity is dubious, but I'm inclined to believe it is more than clear enough for combative application, as it would further explain T's effectiveness in group engagements and splitting her awareness for multitasking. In terms of weaknesses, her lengthy leku and tall montrals present large targets for her opponents, but T has never been seen suffering from this weakness, and it is unlikely that the loss of these extremities would be fatal. Shark is also in extremely good shape, granting her phenomenal levels of stamina and speed far exceeding that of a human, even before taking into account force enhancement. She is also one of the most talented acrobats within the Order, not far off Yoda's level of skill with them in my opinion, and definitely more aware of when and how to use them. The contrast between the three members of this team is stark. The dramatic variance between T's insane stamina and endurance levels and Plo's comparative frailty places even Obi-Wan, the human punching bag that he is, as the relative medium. The onus of this team's advantage in T, more than her physical exceptionality, lies in her sphere sense perception, the trait being one of the most useful abilities anyone could have in a group engagement. As a practical example, imagine T committing to a strike against an opponent. Where any other Jedi would have the auras of their companions broadcast through the Force present behind them, T's Force-augmented Sphere Sense perception allows her to precisely perceive the exact positioning, movements, and, as a result, intentions of her allies. The benefit of this to team synchronicity cannot be understated, and stands as the team's greatest biological advantage. Here we have the A-Team that represents the peak physical condition that combative Jedi strive for, pitted against a team including one Jedi who goes beyond even that, one Jedi that is high on the spectrum but is otherwise just too stubborn to die, and an aging, brittle-boned Keldor. The balance of physical capability firmly lies in Kianikit's favor. Shakti really is carrying the Plo BT team here. She completely outclasses all involved when it comes to stamina, and arguably surpasses the rest's durability as well. She has greater flat-out speed and agility than every other combatant in the fight, and, while not on par in the field of strength, she is no pushover here either. Her sphere sense perception is immensely useful, and easily the greatest of the biological advantages in play in this fight. But it's another advantage that relies solely on T's presence on the team, and on a purely physical level, doesn't bring much benefit to a competition in fitness. This trait will certainly come into play elsewhere, but here it is outclassed by the muscle men's supremacy. Kit Fisto, Anakin Skywalker, and Kiadi Mundi are all examples of the Jedi physical apex. Kiadi Mundi suffers in the area of dexterity as a result of his Syrian binary brain, but excluding that, 
each significantly outclasses Obi-Wan and especially Plo Koon in every regard. Imagining these two teams going up against each other in a fisticuff slogging match, it isn't difficult to imagine which team would come out on top. As such, we give the physical edge to Keanakit. As one of Grandmaster Yoda's former Padawans, it is appropriate that Kiadi Mundi followed his teacher's example and specialized in Ataru. Form 4 lightsaber combat, also called the Aggression Form, Ataru was a heavy offensive martial art built around complex flourishing swordplay and dynamic acrobatic maneuvers. He supplemented this primary discipline with training in Mikashi, the dueling-centric contention form, and Surisu, the purely defensive resilience form. These additional practices served to temper the aggression form, and as a result, Mundi's overall style would be more easily compared to Qui-Gon Jinn's than to Yoda's. He reserved the acrobatics for covering ground and maneuvering, otherwise favoring grounded postures. His blade work remained flowing and elaborate, but was retooled to leverage manual dexterity and strength, sacrificing speed in favor of control. Though he can speed blitz opponents when necessary, it isn't his first response. However, this emphasis on control was a double-edged sword. While his every move is performed with calculated precision to ensure optimal effectiveness, he has no rote response component to fall back on when distracted or surprised, making a loss of composure potentially disastrous. But rather than improve his style and discipline, Mundi chose to ramp up his offensive output to ensure that his composure was never tested. He would open aggressively and escalate as needed. When in doubt, bring in the flamethrowers. Mundi is consistent and steadfast, conservative enough not to overextend himself, but he doesn't always know when to stop, occasionally biting off more than he can chew. As in all other areas, Anakin Skywalker was a natural talent with the lightsaber, rapidly surpassing his peers and attaining a level of skill comparable to the great masters of the Order in less than half the time as those same masters. Where his own master built his skill set with tactical considerations and survivability in mind, specializing in the defense-oriented Sirisu form, Anakin was preoccupied with his quest for might and power, dedicating himself to the aggressive Form 5. Anakin initially trained in Xi'an, though as the Clone Wars progressed, Jem So became his primary focus, his mastery of the strength-oriented art so absolute that Dooku regarded Skywalker as the finest Jem So stylist that he had ever seen. He supplemented this specialization with an advanced application of Ataru, a practice he favored for its dramatic flair. Though Anakin's tactics and battlefield conduct were diametrically opposed to Obi-Wan Kenobi's, he still wore his master's influence on his sleeves. His blade work was very direct and efficient, perfect for both rapid counters and tight defense and his attacks were both blindingly fast and overwhelmingly powerful. However, his grounded footwork reduced his mobility and left him vulnerable to physical combat techniques. To get around this, he personalized his style and effectively hybridized Jem So and Ataru, pairing off Form 5 style blade work and attacks with Form 4 style acrobatics and footwork, with the occasional Ataru flourish thrown in. The result was a trade-off. On the one hand, he overcame Jemso's immobility and amped up his offensive output, but it came at a hefty cost to his defensive viability. Anakin's physical technique served as an expression of his mentality. Skywalker was not a grand strategist. He was a boots-on-the-ground frontline commander, and in his tactics he overwhelmingly favored the direct approach. 
Simply put, regardless of the situation or the number of options that he had at his disposal, Anakin would always take the Death Star trench run approach. He always took the most extreme, high-risk option because it was the most expedient path to victory and because intense combat situations like that were his idea of fun. Because of this high-risk, high-reward approach and his extreme aggression, Anakin was guaranteed to either utterly crush the opposition or be utterly crushed in turn, and I think it's worth noting that most of the lightsaber duels he participated in ended with someone suffering a traumatic amputation. Kit Fisto was one of the most renowned and accomplished Jedi Masters of his day, and Shock T considered him to be one of the finest sword masters the Order had ever produced. Fisto's primary martial arts discipline was Shi Cho, the tutorial style that emphasized simplistic blade work and the complete release of oneself into the currents of the Force. However, while I've stated in past videos that the form was his only discipline, the official Star Wars Encyclopedia also credits him with a moderate level of training in the aggressive and acrobatic Ataru style. Described as a living martial hurricane when pressing the attack, Fisto's personal technique was strong and dynamic, combining bold, direct power attacks with blinding speed and agility. However, he tempered this emotional frenzy with a solid level of refinement, bringing a moderate level of precision and defense to an otherwise randomized and chaotic set of fighting styles. Kit backed up these disciplines with skill in unarmed combat and Jarkai dual weapon fencing, the best example of the latter being his duel with General Grievous. As with most Form 1 specialists, the threat that Fisto represented was based around his intensity and unpredictability, relying on speed-based attack flurries and acrobatic evasions to simultaneously bypass his opponent's attacks and get inside their guard, leaving him primed to unleash a quick and devastating counter. However, Kit's emphasis on this approach also stemmed in large part by his own inability to handle a head-to-head -head engagement. This was a weakness tied directly to his use of Shi Cho, as the style was built for group engagements rather than a single well-trained opponent equipped with a lightsaber. More than once, Fisto has carved his way through swaths of enemies and has even overcome the multi-angular offensive of Grievous. However, when he found himself squaring off against Asajj Ventress, he was outmaneuvered and defeated. While a number of factors contributed to Ventress's victory over the Jedi Master, it should be noted that Fisto himself attributed much of his poor performance to the natural limitations of his own technique. As a tactician and strategist, Kit was… Mm, I hesitate to call him average, as he was actually quite intuitive having a particular talent for recognizing and taking advantage of openings as soon as they were presented and adapting to changing combat situations. However, much of his success in this regard was when he was placed in situations where he didn't have to cut loose, and when operating at his peak, he would often lose himself to the aggression of Shi Cho, which left him very susceptible to tactical blunders. The most immediate thing one notices about this team is their combined offensive output. Each brings a specific combative attribute to the table at a caliber that few others could. Anakin is the direct and focused application of physical power. Kit Fisto is the hurricane given martial form. Kiadi Mundi brings a measured consistency and unyielding persistence. These Jedi are three of a kind focusing on offense as the best defense and ending fights quickly with committed retaliation. But a team is not a team without familiarity. As we know, Kiadi Mundi served as Anakin's master during the early stages of the Clone Wars after Kenobi was declared MIA at the Battle of Jabim. Naturally, the two will have sparred with each other and built up a rapport in this time. The two would go on to fight alongside each other once again, 
during the Second Battle of Geonosis. By the way, Kiadi surpassed Anakin's kill count. Anakin and Kit Fisto would later fight side by side during the Second Battle of Mon Calamari. While there are no examples of Kiadi Mundi and Kit Fisto partnering up, the two did fight together during the First Battle of Geonosis and were familiar with each other as fellow Council Masters. These guys have a reputation as frontline commanders for a reason. As a collective, they are likely to operate as a tip of the spear assault force. Kiadi Mundi would take charge of the team. He is the senior Jedi of the three and has demonstrated his talent as a rallying point in times of crisis. Anakin would focus on combating the enemy just as he did alongside Kenobi and would coordinate with Mundi, using him as the anvil to hammer their opponents. Bisto would go lone wolf, unleashing his flurries in a screening action around the two, keeping his unpredictable flailing from endangering his allies while cleaving through enemy forces like a hot knife through butter. Plo Koon is arguably the third greatest military mind within the Jedi Order, one of only ten masters given the rank of Jedi High General. Both on and off the battlefield, Plo is a capable strategist and tactician. He is able to stay focused on the needs of the moment without losing sight of larger objectives, a balance many of his contemporaries fail to achieve. He is well known for his proficiency with a lightsaber, considered one of the best duelists of his era. Even Sith apprentice Darth Maul, renowned for his skill and overwhelming arrogance both, considered Kuhn a great warrior, wanting to test his skills against him in battle. Specializing in Form 5 of lightsaber combat, mastering both variants Gem So and Shien, Kuhn was a duelist that focused heavily on holding a strong defense and backing it up with powerful counteroffensives, taking the form down its defensively focused path rather than its domineeringly offensive one. Alongside his mastery of Form 5, Kuhn dedicated himself to mastering Form 4, Ataru, his incorporation of different Ataru techniques effectively removing Gemso's primary weakness in mobility. In keeping with the MO of Form 5 specialists, Plo's technique involved precise and deadly strikes with as much power behind them as possible. He optimized his precision by taking as much time with his movements as was practical rarely if ever relying on the usual flurries of blade work employed by most lightsaber duelists, even compared to other Form 5 specialists. Where other users of Form 5 would continually incorporate high-speed dedicated power strikes into their sequences, Kuhn saved his strength for the weak link in his enemy's chain, allowing him to conserve his energy and remain fresh in a fight, where others would tire themselves out. Plo is also known to be a master of unarmed combat, likely another attribute enhanced by his education in Ataru. The exact details regarding his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills are unknown, but it is reasonable to assume that he has, at the very least, an advanced skill level with his once Padawan Swan's sliding hands Kazi. The Keldor has also demonstrated great aptitude in his use of force abilities in combat. He has used powerful pushes and shoves to throw opponents around and off-balance their offenses, often directly affecting the outcome of his fights with such tactics. Plo Koon's advanced lightsaber technique and martial prowess, coupled with his combative mentality and tactical ingenuity, made for an incredibly powerful skill set. He seems to hold off all but the most brutally unconventional assaults with ease, even when at a massive disadvantage, and his retaliative offense is powerful and precise, allowing him to break an opponent with minimal expense of energy. He has no problem handling single or multiple opponents and can take and keep control of almost any situation. And in the rare case that he can't, his diverse range of options allow him to weather all but the strongest of storms. A natural talent with the lightsaber, Obi-Wan stood as one of the greatest swordmasters in galactic history and was proclaimed by Mace Windu as the reigning Form 3 Master of the Era. Kenobi specialized in the defensive Sarisu style and the aggressive Ataru style. As with all things, Kenobi's technique was characterized by a modest, elegant simplicity. When defending, he would keep his blade close to his body and keep his movements tight, 
relying on an intricate pattern of blocks and parries to shunt aside strikes as they came, while a precise minimal shift of weight and stance enabled him to perform deft evasions. As noted in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, Kenobi's lightsaber defenses were sufficient enough to effectively stonewall Count Dooku and Darth Vader, as well as block up to 20 strikes per second from the CIS commander General Grievous. When forced onto the offensive, he was quite varied, smoothly transitioning between power blows, wrist flick slashes, and sweeps. He reinforced this fluid pairing of Forms 3 and 4 with a tertiary mastery of the aforementioned Shi Cho, the countercentric Xien style, and Force-focused Naiman, the Jar Kai variant of the latter form bolstering his fighting style. This was most evident in his duel with Darth Maul and Savage Opress on Florum, where his immense skill allowed him to hold off and even surpass the two. He was even able to slice off one of Opress's arms and drive the pair into a retreat. An active field agent and acclaimed military general, Obi-Wan Kenobi was wildly regarded as one of the greatest strategic minds of his day. Distinguished by his calm and calculating mindset, and his specific reliance on deception and diversionary tactics to accomplish his goals. To this end, his battlefield conduct was based around the ideals of subterfuge and misdirection. In his own words, a fight is never a goal in itself. Sometimes it is simply a distraction from the true goal and best countered with a larger distraction. In single combat, he was able to stay focused on the needs of the moment while still maintaining a broader situational awareness, keeping his opponents at arm's length with his impenetrable defense and waiting them out until they had either tired or overextended themselves, then dispatching them in the blink of an eye. An expert at using the environment to his advantage, Kenobi was fond of baiting adversaries and guiding battles to locations of his own choice, where he had the home field advantage. This pragmatic mindset was reinforced by his aptitude for strategic analysis and evaluation, learning the weaknesses and oversights of his opponents, and tailoring his own responses accordingly. Shaq T is an accomplished military general in her own right, and proved this early into the Clone Wars. She was another of the ten Jedi given the rank of Jedi High General, and led many fronts to victory throughout the conflict. T's reputation as one of the greatest swordmasters of the era is equally well earned. She has completely mastered forms 2 and 4 both, and blends the two styles together to create a lethal partnership of wild speed and agility with focused and deadly precision. T uses the flamboyant and energetic blade work of Ataru to outmaneuver any of her opponent's advances and pierce their lower defenses with the deft thrusts and controlled sweeps of Makashi. An opponent attacks, she redirects or evades the attack, and strikes back with a veritable barrage of slashes and thrusts. T's intensity was insane, and she rarely held back when on the offensive, giving her assaults everything she had in speed, agility, and strength. Duelists with this sort of approach to offense were typically singular in their focus, often at the expense of situational awareness. This is not the case with T, however, who almost ceaselessly displays her tactical awareness in her fights, using distractions to bait an opponent and allow for perfectly timed force pushes, maneuvering groups of opponents into positions that limit their advantage of numbers, and manipulating her environment to her favor. Despite having this powerful and overwhelming offensive potential at her disposal, T rarely employs such an approach for extended periods, instead conserving her energy and unleashing it in sporadic bursts. In regards to defense, Shakti was just as strong, against single opponents and particularly groups. This is especially impressive, as it means that she compensated for both the primary weaknesses of her chosen forms, the flawed economy of movement in Ataru and the deflection-limited Makashi. However, T's defense is not impregnable. Though her parries and blocks are strong, her preferred response is to dodge attacks, not take them head-on, instead relying on her superior maneuverability. 
The Tegruten Master has also displayed a lethal proficiency for unarmed combat, parrying the blows of three Magna Guards with her bare hands, and using Force Enhanced Speed to decapitate another with her knee. She is also unopposed to using her Force abilities to their fullest, routinely incorporating them into her lightsaber sequences. Her timing, precision, and power with such attacks are devastating, and she uses them for offense and defense, both subtly and bluntly. Shakti's martial skill is partnered perfectly with her tactical ingenuity, and all facets of her approach to combat are unpredictable, powerful, and diverse. When her more blunt and conventional methods have failed her, T has shown incredible subtlety in her responses. She is also extraordinarily skilled at multitasking, shown through her manipulation of the Greater Sarlacc within the ancient abyss of Felucia, as well as some Force-sensitive natives during her duel with Galen Marek. She can defend against a ridiculous number of opponents, outmaneuvering them and countering with deadly results, and when she switches to offense, she can overwhelm almost any foe. The true core of this team lies in its shared defensive mentality. All three focus on enduring and undermining their adversaries rather than powering through them outright, and each accomplishes this in different but almost equally effective ways. Obi-Wan is the brick wall you slam your head against in futility. Plo Koon is the anvil that hits back at the hammer, and Shak Ti is the leaf on the wind that dances around your cut. Each are bringing different method statements to the table, but all denote Bastion. Perhaps illogically, these three Jedi High Generals have, on a number of occasions, been assigned to the same galactic theatres. Camino, Brentel IV, Rendil. These three have fought beside each other many times, strengthening their pre-existing bonds on the harsh battlefronts their shared military burden thrust upon them. The burden was well placed. These three spheres of influence throughout the galaxy shouldn't really overlap, but if they did, woe betide the enemy that moves against them. Plo would coordinate the team. We have seen his seniority in play on numerous occasions, with these two themselves even. Obi-Wan is the keystone of the team, keeping the unit cohesive by stonewalling the enemy and drawing the line of battle. And T, largely as a result of her sphere sense perception and greater mobility, would be the reactionary satellite element, working around and with her companions as they make each tactical call throughout the fight. Here we have Durin's Bane versus Mithrandir, an unstoppable force of offensive might held at bay by an unflinching defender. Just as these two adversaries share the same power level of Maya, so too do the two teams share a similar weight in skill. Where the differences show is between the team's respective approaches and mindsets. Kianakit, like the Balrog, is all about the physical manifestation and channeling of power, charging in headfirst and sweeping enemies aside. Plobity, like Gandalf, is all about subtlety and misdirection, eliminating threats with shrewd guile. These Six's sabers clashing would be a long-term engagement, pushing both sides to their limits and beyond. In a direct confrontation with both sides throwing everything they have at each other, the fight definitely leans in Kianikit's favor. The nature of Kit's fighting style allows him to pinball between combatants and force them to react with each disrupting flurry. This backed up with the combined ramming power of Anakin and Kiati's more straightforward methods allows the team to blunt any spear thrust against them. Any combined assault is going to be split in twain by the Martial Hurricane. It is fortunate for Plo BT, then, that they both recognize this fact and specialize in its circumnavigation. A martial battle between these two teams is not going to be opened with a climactic charge from both sides. Instead, it's going to be one team charging forward and the other giving ground. Obi-Wan is at his best when on his back foot. He implodes near impenetrable defense holding off whichever offensive combination Kianikit throws their way, so long as they could keep the backpedaling going. 
Shakti, meanwhile, serves as the team's offensive counter, watching for and forcing open gaps in the enemy's offense. Kianakit's barrage would soon either overextend or stumble in the face of T's satellite disruption. We know from past displays that both defenders can match what their attackers can bring to the table without question in the short term and reliably in the long. With T's countering added to the mix, they are able to comfortably remain on the defensive and wait for an opening to present itself. This is because each member of the Kianakit team has a history of overextending in battle. Anakin and Kit both overcommit, be it Anakin in the Geonosian hangar or Kit in the Chancellor's office. Kiati may not be as overtly reckless, but he has bitten off more than he can chew on more than one occasion, most notably against Grievous on Hypori. This would drastically affect their team coordination, as it would force them to react to what the other team is doing rather than controlling the action. This isn't to say that the Plo BT team is flawless. Plo Koon can be distracted, sometimes fatally. Obi-Wan can't be directly overpowered, but he can be subverted. Shock T is at her best when keeping the opponent at arm's length, but has trouble holding down a head-to-head -head engagement. This means that their team dynamic can be shattered if they are separated or if one of them dies. Problem is, the Kianakit team can't capitalize on these weaknesses due to the limitations of their own approaches. Plo Koon won't be distracted because he knows that his teammates can look after themselves, so he won't trouble himself with protecting them like he did the clones. None of them can subvert Kenobi because all of their styles are based on direct offense, and the only one who is powerful enough to overwhelm Shock T is Anakin, and even then, it would take him a while. By contrast, many of the Ploby T's strengths are specifically against the limitations of the Kianakit team. Kit Fisto, no matter who he goes up against, is facing someone who is perfectly optimized to deflect his wild flurries and slip encounters, cutting him down. While Anakin can maintain defensive coverage while locking in a head-to-head -head bout, his reckless acrobatic maneuvers were his downfall against Kenobi, and would be prime for Plo and T to exploit any day of the week. Kiati's consistency makes him a tougher nut to crack, but his stubborn persistence would allow him to be led by the nose by the opposing Jedi and ultimately brought to heel through attrition. At the end of the day, the primary difference between the two teams was in their skill configurations. Though all six combatants drew from multiple techniques, the Kianakit team focused all of their skill into singular offensive styles, which provided a high performance level, but left them over-specialized. By contrast, the Plobiti team used their various techniques as a rotating wheel of skill configurations, allowing them to radically alter their stance in battle with no loss of performance. For these reasons, we give the edge in martial arts combat to Plobiti. Kiyadi Mundi trained as a Jedi Guardian, the physical combat specialists of the Jedi Order, typically identified by their blue lightsabers, though Mundi has also wielded purple and green blades throughout his career. As a master, he was distinguished by his ability to focus on immediate concerns while remaining conscious of the broader situation, demonstrated when he rescued his daughter from the criminal Effent Mon while avoiding the political entanglements connected with the incident. In practical use, this mentality expressed itself through Mundi's conservative but direct application of power. Control abilities focused on manipulating the force within one's own body. Kiati Mundi's ability to enhance his physical perception and performance levels came courtesy of Altus Sopor, the basic force focus meditation. Continuing in this vein, he displayed a mastery of Curado Salva, or Force Heal. Though unable to mend broken bones, he could heal flesh wounds within minutes. 
However, he displayed no exceptional mastery of Tutaminus, and therefore had no force-derived defense against energy-based attacks. Bridging the gap between control and sense was Battle Mind, an inwardly focused telepathic meditation that improved Mundi's focus and morale in combat. Sense abilities encompassed a broader awareness of the currents of the Force, linking minds through emotional empathy and active telepathy. Kiadi Mundi displayed a particularly insidious mastery of the Jedi mind trick, inducing fear and anxiety in a subject during interrogation. Making this application more questionable was Mundi's awareness that testimony acquired through these means was inadmissible in court. On the more positive end, his ability to form an empathic bond with his auric steed saved his life, allowing him to summon it into battle with a thought and calm its aggression afterwards. He is also credited with some capability with Force Stealth, though the manner and degree with which he used this ability is unknown. Alter abilities involved reaching out and manipulating the Force beyond oneself, affecting the environment directly. The primary ability within this field was telekinesis, which Mundi used to move objects, thrash enemies, and defend himself. His maximum lifting strength was several tons, while his kinetic output was sufficient to leave craters in the earth. Though quick on the draw when necessary, Mundi was reserved in his use of direct force abilities, preferring to capitalize on external factors, summoning his Oryx in the battle, or calling in the flamethrowers. Also a Jedi Guardian, Anakin Skywalker was a prodigal force talent, boasting a midichlorian count in excess of 20,000 per cell. As a Jedi trainee, he was the most talented student of his generation and wielded advanced practical ability, though he never fully accepted the philosophy. A master lightsaber duelist, Anakin's primary focus was force-based physical enhancement, a power he demonstrated since childhood, specifically enhanced reflexes when piloting. Jedi training would flesh this out to include augmented agility and strength, both of which became major components in his fighting style. Anakin was of the opinion that the best defense was a strong offense, channeling most of his power into offensive telekinesis. He employed direct force pushes to stagger and thrash individual opponents, powerful force waves to scatter massed groups of enemies, and telekinetic throws to turn anything not bolted down into a lethal projectile, particularly favoring the lightsaber throw. However, Anakin also strongly favored force grip, which he used to throttle targets or crush their rib cages. A skillful telepath, Anakin was capable of using mind tricks to influence even large groups, and he could use beast trick to calm and influence animals. Though never outright stated, given his mechanical aptitude, I believe that Anakin possessed a gift for Makuduru, building droids, modding starfighters, and customizing his own prosthesis. Anakin's training as a Jedi took place during a period of social unrest leading up to Galactic War, and his mentality reflected the times. Furthermore, as so much of Anakin's development took place on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, he never learned reverence for the Force, instead regarding it as a tool to be used and abused, a perception encouraged by Chancellor Palpatine. However, as a combative adept, Anakin's primary focus was lightsaber combat, using the Force almost exclusively as a supplement, and his applications were generally quite reactive. Not because he was unwilling to use it, but because it simply wasn't his first instinct. He much preferred overpowering adversaries with physical combat to overwhelming them with ethereal combat. The only consular on his team, Kit Fisto was a dedicated force wielder whose notoriety stemmed primarily from the variety of his powers rather than the magnitude. 
Due to the aggressive and demanding nature of the Styles Fisto favors, he was particularly talented at bolstering his speed and agility through physical augmentation. His skills with telekinesis were considerable, though many of his most notable applications have been for utility purposes rather than combat, moving extremely heavy objects or manipulating the trajectory of his lightsaber mid-flight. That being said, he has employed quite effective telekinetic strikes in combat, employing them quite freely against mercenaries and battle droids. While such overtly insidious applications were rare, the TCW comic The Gauntlet of Death even depicts Kit violently snapping the neck of a Geonosian warrior with the Force. However, he has never employed such attacks during serious bouts with opposing Force wielders. This reluctance stemmed primarily from his belief that incessant uses of telekinesis in single combat was excessive, only using his powers when absolutely necessary, and often preaching restraint when instructing his students. As a telepath, Kit was capable, but nothing to write home about. He was versed in the basic mind trick and appeared to possess a limited faculty with force concealment, which allowed him to mask his force signature from other adepts, though it's never been established whether or not he can cloak himself from beings who were actively trying to seek him out. While Fisto possessed no aptitude with or against energy-based force abilities or force magics, he did possess several powers that went beyond the usual standard associated with followers of the Jedi Order. When operating underwater, he was able to use the force to manipulate water currents and compress them into a tight beam that could be directed towards a desired target. He even developed his own unique force ability, designated as the Force Water Orb. Essentially a giant telekinetically reinforced bubble, the orb was formed by shaping force energy into a hollow sphere around the surrounding environment and could be used to create small pockets of air to house allies when undersea survival apparatuses were damaged. In combat, it functioned on a similar principle to that of kinetite, in that it acted as a solid object capable of ripping through durasteel when thrown. While the nature of these abilities obviously required Fisto to be operating in a specialized environment in order to be effectively utilized, they are indicative of the immense skill and power the Jedi Master wields. Just as with their martial arts skills, this team's greatest asset is the direct application of power, all three using their abilities to destroy entire armies in battle. Anakin Skywalker is a telekinetic battering ram, unleashing his raw power in the Force to devastate his environment and pummel his enemies. Kit Fisto boasts an unconventional loadout of alternative abilities, maximizing his ability to exploit circumstantial factors and bewilder his enemies. Kiadi Mundi wields his rock-solid mastery of traditional abilities with a knack for escalating situations. This configuration of skills reinforces their ability to function as a tip-of-the-spear assault force. As the coordinator, Kiadi would direct Anakin and Kit in their applications of the force while reinforcing them with a conservative use of his own abilities. Kit Fisto would use his array of unconventional abilities to subvert and trip up enemies, while Anakin, as the most powerful of the three, would be the offensive heavyweight. In an ideal situation, this would allow them to effectively steamroll potentially any opponent, with Kiadi's coordination allowing for an effective mixture of Kit Fisto's subversion and Anakin's brute force. However, this cooperation is undermined by each combatant's foibles, Anakin Skywalker's greatest strength is also his greatest weakness. He is the most powerful Force-sensitive in existence, yet he is not completely in control of himself or his power. Oftentimes, Anakin gets so caught up in Force channeling that he fails to make effective use of his active abilities. Kit Fisto's shortcomings stem from his over-specialization. He has a myriad of unique techniques at his disposal, yet most are only applicable in specialized environments, and his conventional abilities are just that, conventional. Kiadi Mundi has a similar problem. 
While not lacking for skill, his ability to escalate situations is based on his ability to exploit circumstantial factors, bringing in the flamethrowers rather than his own power. All this isn't to say that the team is non-functional, they just lack cohesion in the long term, and even then, this isn't a crippling weakness, as all three have shown a history of clawing their way out of untenable situations by digging deep and channeling their power fully. As a lifelong member of the Jedi High Council, it is hardly surprising that Plo Koon is one of the most powerful force wielders of his era. Unlike some of his contemporaries, however, his notability with his use of the force is primarily due to his variety and not his magnitude. Plo has a plethora of skills that stem from his advanced knowledge of science. He is able to alter the physical state of small objects and affect change to the environment around him. He is also a skilled user of Malaysia, a technique that alters the equilibrium of a target and incapacitates them. He was also extremely advanced in his use of telepathy, and was able to probe the mind of Aiko Stark from a great distance, without revealing his intrusion. Even more notable is the fact that he did this while in communication with the Jedi Council on the other side of the galaxy, seemingly without strain. While this is an impressive feat few could match, the latter half of this example was only possible due to his bond with his niece, Shah Kun, and was also likely bolstered by their shared Keldor heritage. Nonetheless, this is a clear demonstration of Kuhn's mental capabilities. Plo also spent time with his own people, training with the Barando Sages of Doran, where he learned and mastered the Anya Sef technique, which allows the user to safeguard against mental intrusion, further adding to his repertoire. Plo backed up this extensive set of uncommon skills with the more run-of-the-mill abilities used by most Jedi, though the manner in which he applied these techniques in combat differed greatly. For example, while fully capable of boosting his speed, strength, and stamina to the superhuman levels common among the Jedi, in fact a master of the technique, Kuhn held back on this power far more than his contemporaries, applying it in short bursts and only when necessary, in keeping with his preferred approach to combat, slow and steady, but well-timed and powerful. In regards to telekinesis, Plo was considered a savant along the likes of Dooku, again choosing to apply this skill with cunning and control rather than overwhelming power. Where powerhouses like Anakin Skywalker would blast an opponent with a wave of telekinetic energy, pushing opponents out of his reach, Plo would use his lighter shoves to off-balance them, or manipulate objects to distract them, before closing the distance to finish with his lightsaber. This restraint is not to be mistaken for unwillingness, however, as in all things, Plo is a practical and pragmatic individual. He has used such powerful attacks, and has even penetrated the force shields used to defend against such methods a notable feat even among Jedi Masters. He will use all tools at his disposal to strike out at injustice, and the Force is no exception, but he does so with calm and control. Plo Koon uses the Force as a sharpened sword, not a blunt hammer. He is the embodiment of balanced justice, not overzealous revenge. With that in mind, we come to Plo's most infamous Force ability, Electric Judgment. Plo discovered this ability during an investigation that led to a small child being held hostage by the criminal Pommel. To temporarily disable Pommel before he could harm the child, Plo instinctively used the ability. When questioned by the council as to whether or not he thought his decision right, Plo pointed out that it saved the child and that he had remained completely in control of his emotions, acting on what was right and necessary, not fear, anger or desperation. The council asked if he would use the power again and he replied that it would be irresponsible not to develop such a useful combative ability. While typically used to incapacitate, Electric Judgment does have the capacity to kill, and is a powerful weapon in Kuhn's arsenal. To put it simply, Obi-Wan Kenobi's connection to the light side was legendary. A master of force empowerment, he could enhance his reflexes to allow for feats such as blast deflection, and boost his strength to the point where he could catch and bend General Grievous's duranium alloy forearm with his bare hand. These capabilities were reinforced by his mastery of force speed and breath control, the latter allowing him to breathe underwater and survive for extended periods in poisonous atmospheres. In the realm of telekinesis, Kenobi strongly emphasized subversion over brute force, 
using force throws to pelt foes with loose objects and manipulate his lightsaber in midair. Though my favorite display was when he effortlessly bypassed Darth Vader's force shield and spasmed the circuitry of his mechanical hand, causing the Sith Lord to inadvertently drop his weapon. However, this focus on subtlety did not transfer into an inability to overwhelm opponents with raw power. He has broken the barriers of powerful individuals such as Asherad Het, Asajj Ventress, Darth Maul, and Darth Vader with directed force pushes, liquefied the body of the Jendai bounty hunter Dirge with a force repulse, and on one occasion unleashed a force wave that uprooted three trees, each larger than a freighter, and placed them into position to break the freefall of the ship he was hanging onto. While his passive TK defense was a bit spotty, Kenobi's active defense was top tier. Having parried the force pushes and waves of Count Dooku and Darth Vader, and deflected projectiles fired at him by Dirge, and shards of glass hurled at him by Ventress. A highly advanced telepath, Obi-Wan has employed everything from basic mind tricks to the beast control ability, and has been credited with the immunity to fear effects and mental interference by the TCW Campaign Guide and the novel Wild Space. As far as his mastery of alternative force abilities were, Kenobi was capable of force healing, blaster bolt level 2 to menace, and the obscure sound mimicry, notably using the latter to imitate the roar of a wild crate dragon to scare away the small band of Tusken Raiders who were attacking Luke Skywalker. Obi-Wan is perhaps most famous for his ability to transcend the physical plane as a Force spirit, surviving his physical death. While this power obviously has no combative applications, it speaks volumes about the strength and depth of the Jedi Master's connection to the life force of the universe. As a long-term member of the Jedi High Council, Shakti is also one of the most powerful Force wielders of her era. In contrast to Master Plo, she is an example of a Jedi noted for the magnitude of her abilities, and not the range. She compensates for her relatively limited array of powers by taking those she does have to their highest potency. Shakti is a paragon for Force augmentation of physical abilities. She has taken her already impressive levels of speed and stamina and enhance them to the point that she can continue a marathon lightsaber duel while constantly on the move for nearly 15 minutes, requiring only brief respites to regather her energy, as demonstrated in her second confrontation with Grievous, where she was going all out almost the entire time, and only began to suffer from her exhaustion after her extensive and intense application of force speed. T's telepathic abilities are also extremely advanced, aided by her proclivity for multitasking. She was able to mentally tame the greater Sarlacc within Felucia's ancient abyss, simultaneously influencing the four sensitive natives of the planet while dueling Galen Marek, using both her extremely intensive lightsaber style as well as her overwhelmingly powerful force pushes. To maintain such extreme control over such powerful and numerous forces without suffering more strain than T displayed is exceptional. As if this wasn't evidence enough of her power in the Force, over the many years she spent hiding on Felucia, T managed to influence the very Force state of the planet itself. And when she was defeated, the planet almost immediately fell to the corruption of the dark side. T's aptitude for telekinesis is devastating. She is able to hurl large objects at high speeds with apparent ease, and her Force pushes are capable of blasting solid objects into craters. When she focuses more on control than less on power, she is able to expertly manipulate objects, making use of this talent to manipulate her saber in her fight with the Magna Guards, and in a demonstration of cunning subtlety, tied Grievous' cape to a departing maglev bullet train. T is also capable of breaking through the force shields of opponents, and has a little difficulty throwing around even the most powerful force sensitives. She makes full use of her skill in telekinesis, with a talent for and willingness to incorporate such attacks into her lightsaber sequences, doing so with practiced ease. T is also capable of rudimentary force deflection, formerly known as Tutaminus, using this ability in her first fight against Grievous. Though unable to neutralize the kinetic energy and thus sent flying, T's basic proficiency for the technique saved her life, and it is a notable last-ditch defense. 
Shakti was also capable of energy-based offensives, similar in nature to Kinetite. However, she has only been shown using such abilities on Felucia, where the ambient life energies of the jungle planet would undoubtedly reduce the amount of personal energy required to use them. As this ambient energy would not be available in a neutral arena, this will not come into play. But it is another clear demonstration of T's strength in and skill with the Force. Each member of this team treads a different path to the same destination. As with all things regarding their approach to combat, the three opt for subtlety and misdirection wherever possible, and blunt precision whenever not, using their abilities to control their fights and only throwing weight around when pushed to their exceedingly distant limits. Plo Koon is in a class of his own. He has an exceedingly large repertoire of abilities at his disposal, yet he uses them very conservatively. Obi-Wan Kenobi is a pure conduit of the Force, allowing the light to flow through him and lead him to the safest victory. Shakti, the most overtly powerful of the three, is always looking for the moment she can hit you with a bullet train. Unfortunately, specialization in one area brings weakness in another. The skill configurations the three have brought together leave them well-rounded enough to alleviate this concern in most situations, but no approach is without flaw. Despite Plo's high performance level, his general competence in all areas prevents him from as readily bringing his full power to bear in any one area. All the passivity of Kenobi's methods that fuel his advantage in lightsaber combat unfortunately leaves his force defenses compromised. Shakti, while predominantly defensive, has been known to overcommit in the use of her powers. Fortunately, these weaknesses, serious though they may be, do not limit the team's effectiveness as a combative unit, due to their complementary skill sets. The big thing to discuss with this verdict is the wide spectrum of skill and power each of these Jedi can create when analyzed as a collective. Anakin Skywalker is without a doubt the most powerful, not just of his team, but of all present, technically ever. If he had ever lived up to his potential, Kiati and Kit could take a nap for all the difference it would make to the team's outcome. Anakin is irrefutably the most powerful Force-sensitive of all time, and to understand what that means, take a look at the second most powerful. The problem is that Anakin did not live up to his potential, and does not make effective and full use of his power. We have two instances of him reaching the peak of his potential. Once on the battlefields of Prosethalin, where he essentially triggered an Avatar state of Force-channeled augmentation, and another in his duel against Count Dooku on the Invisible Hand. There is no question that had Anakin been able to channel this power at will, and not just in response to rage-inducing failure, he would crush Plobity in a Force duel. As it stands, he is merely another of the Jedi's big guns. These two teams share a comparable level of power, neither one having any particular advantage over the other in the scale of Force abilities they are bringing to the table. However, there is a clear disparity between the two teams' demonstrated precision and tactical finesse. The Kianica team, as mentioned, is all about the direct application of power. While by no means lacking in general precision, their typical first response is to crush the opposition in the most direct fashion possible. Be it a devastating telekinetic maelstrom from Anakin, a giant death bubble from Kit Fisto, or... Bring in the flamethrowers! Yeah. In most situations, their efforts are usually successful, making the team a very viable threat in this matchup. Kenobi's lacking TK defenses can potentially be exploited by every member of the Kianica team. Plo is versatile enough to defend against anything leveled against him, but has no specific strengths to leverage, and can be overpowered. And Shakti typically keeps her bases covered, but has been known to overextend her power. As a unit, the Kianicate team definitely has an advantage in a straight contest of power. The problem is, this is all they can do. The strength of the Plobity team 
is, to put it simply, Kiana Kit's greatest weakness. While they are more than capable of taking the direct approach when necessary, their greatest edge is ultimately subversion and tactical ingenuity. Obi-Wan Kenobi is an incredibly creative telekinetic genius who applies his powers with absolute subtlety and fluidity. In fact, we do have an example of him successfully using his skill to sabotage Anakin Skywalker. And if he can do it against him, then Kit and Kiati are a given. None of the Kanakit team has any skill with Tuta Menace, so Plo Koon gets an automatic free ride with his electric judgment, which is made all the worse when we consider that he does a lot of the same shit with TK as Kenobi. Shakti, meanwhile, commands a similar level of magnitude as Anakin Skywalker, while still maintaining a level of fine control compatible to her teammates. What we have here is essentially a team who can combine their powers for maximum effect to devastate their surroundings nearly as well as their opponents, and back it up with greater skill and cunning. These advantages are made all the more important when we consider the Kiana Kit's comparable limitations as force wielders. Kit Fisto is powerful, yes, but his most potent abilities require selective environments in order to be used properly. Anakin may be the most powerful one present, but he is also the least skilled of all present. He knows how to be creative when absolutely necessary, but it is almost never his first response, and his actual skill set is fairly narrow. Kiadi Mundi's fatal weakness is his need to maintain focus and composure. Whenever he is distracted, he falls apart. However, he is aware of this shortcoming and works hard to keep it together. Rather, his more relevant weakness is simply his lack of power. His methods are creative because they need to be. He can't unleash the destructive fury of the Force, so he needs to use others to do that for him. On the whole, the biggest deciding factor for these two teams as Force wielders is the configuration of their skill sets. The success of the Kianakit team is predicated on their ability to effectively brace up against the opposition and overpower them with superior strength of the Force. By contrast, the Plobiti team's success is predicated on leveraging this same strength down the path of least resistance. Furthermore, they are entirely capable of meeting their enemies head-to-head -head in a direct contest of power, albeit with the goal of simply guarding against such direct applications of the Force. In essence, the Plobiti team can neutralize the Kianakit team's direct offensive surges, while the Kianakit team is specifically vulnerable against the tactical subversions favored by the Plobiti team. For these reasons, we award Plo Koon, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Shock T the edge as force wielders. Of all the facets analyzed, the first to enter the foreground of this fight would be the tactical. Of all the aspects of force combat, the first love of all six knights is lightsaber dueling and battlefield tactics. Therefore, this would be the way in which the fight would start. As we've discussed previously, the two teams share a similar breadth in skill, but are distinguished by radically different approaches and mentalities. Purely in regards to skill set configuration, Kianakit's accumulative lightsaber technique is very singular. Yes, they pull from multiple sources, but their actual methods are singularly focused on offense. The team is flexible, but not to the point of true versatility, all of their offensive options being exactly that, offensive options. This doesn't make them any less dangerous than their opponents, but it does limit their approach to any given situation. It's worth noting that they are not incapable of adopting a defensive stance. We are simply saying that doing so is almost never their first instinct, and they lack experience in this area when compared to their opponents. 
On the PloBD side, they have the mirror issue. Each of the team heavily focusing on defence to the point that their offensive output seems lacking in comparison. Looking at these two mirrored teams, on paper you may suspect an impasse. Kianikit's overwhelming assault failing to overwhelm Plobiti, while their retaliatory offensive output fails to undermine their focused aggressors. In reality, however, this is not the case. Each member of Plobiti may be less overbearing in the offensive arena, however, their skill sets are far more versatile and their mindsets are specifically tempered to recognize this issue earlier in the fight than their more aggressive, physically focused opponents. Moving away from the lightsabers for the moment then, we come to the team's tactical inclinations. Kianikit may rival the tenacity and ingenuity of Plobiti on the battlefront, but when it comes to single combat specifically, each of the three rely on their own personal power, rather than circumstantial factors. They're good at exploiting an enemy's mistakes, but creating openings on the tactical front is not in their nature. These are Jedi that let go of everything but their immediate intent, Death Star Trench Runners. Not Jedi that truly let go of everything, their open mindsets feeding not just their spirituality, but their nuanced tactical talents. Master, you can make it, but everyone else is getting shot down. Master! I should have performed better. You were brilliant. What more could you have done? I should have gone closer to the edge, Kit said. Released myself into the Force. Become more unpredictable. More random. That would have been dangerous, Obi-Wan said. Not to your body, perhaps, but to your spirit. Kit looked up at him. It is the way of Form One. Everyone out! No! We must pursue! General, we can't. The survivors will die. This disparity between the two teams' mindsets affords a hefty advantage to Plobiti's combative approach. Their defensive focus buys them the time and breathing space they need to strategize and coordinate and, in turn, allow them to attack their opponents in ways that circumvent their own offensive deficiencies. This is greatly helped along by the presence of Shock T's Sphere Sense Perception and the fact that the three's own offensive output is entirely dependent on countering. The leading by the nose tactical inclinations lending itself to lining up such counterattacks. If Kianikit took a moment to breathe and take a step back, dialing down the offensive barrage that so often gets them in over their heads, they would definitely escape this pitfall, but doing so would also nullify their greatest asset. The three commit so heavily to their offensives in order to overwhelm and break their opponents, which they can't do if they alleviate the pressure. Conservative Kiadi, Kitfisto, and Anakin are forces to be reckoned with by most standards, certainly, but not at the bracket of council-level combat they operate on when truly letting themselves go. It really doesn't help that the whole of the Kianikit team has experience fighting opponents with a similar mentality, namely Asajj Ventress, all but Kit proving that their approach just needed to be amped up to bully through her interference. This may have worked against Ventress, but Ventress is not the brick wall of defensive focus that Obi-Wan, Plo Koon, and Shakti are. Not even close. And just as it is with lightsaber combat, so it is with force abilities. This same self-defeating cycle of offensive escalation at the expense of tactical awareness blunts Kianikit's effectiveness against the type of threat Plo BT represents. In terms of raw force power, only T compares to Anakin and Kit's overwhelming output. But in terms of application, each member of the PloBT team sweeps the board. Variety, precision, timing, intent. Team PloBT takes the gold in all. That being said, there is a literal chink in the armor of the defensive team when it comes to the force that must be addressed. Obi-Wan Kenobi, while exceptionally powerful, even counted amongst this group of Jedi, is a passive channeler in nature. He lets the force flow through him like a gentle stream, and his focus and intuition is beyond most anyone as a result. However, this submissive relationship with the force, considered more a powerful tool than an ally by the rest of the combatants, leaves Kenobi with comparatively lacking force defenses. Kianikit, Plo, and T all keep their walls shored up at all times as a matter of course. 
Kenobi calls on it only when necessary, and if he misses one of those necessary moments, his attention focused elsewhere, with the power level of these combatants, he's going to be sent flying. Clearly, the defensive team, for all their advantages, is not without their foibles. While the deficiencies of the Kianikit combination seem numerous in this analysis, that is merely a result of their present circumstances. The baseline reliability of their team's performance cannot be understated. Theirs is simply an outfit poorly suited for taking on the team they are aligned against here. Against most anyone else, the offensive power of this team would steamroll. The three are a perfect example of why so many Jedi follow the path of direct offense. With the power of the Force at their disposal, particularly to the extent of this group, there's rarely a reason to try anything else. They do, as we've discussed, have a distinct advantage in the purely physical sense. Aside from the disparity in fitness, however, there is also the matter of Plo's breathing apparatus. If distracted by concern for allies, Plo is known to leave himself open to attack here. However, we do not feel the potential target of his mask is particularly relevant in a lightsaber duel, as those precious few capable of penetrating his defences are going to be taking his head off. The mask going with it is somewhat superfluous at that point. On top of this, Plo BT are, even if it is planned, giving their enemy the initiative in this fight. They have to maintain a careful balance between baiting their opponents to draw them in and triggering the fight's biggest wildcard, i.e. Anakin. As we discussed previously, Anakin at his best is the most powerful combatant in the Star Wars setting. If Plo BT inadvertently move from light provocation to actively stoking his fury, they're going to have a bad time. In an ideal scenario, they would take Anakin down first to avoid this, but unfortunately for them, how unfortunately for everyone, no one is quite aware of just how unstable Anakin really is. Even his master, the one that knows him better than any other, being on their team isn't enough to offset this, as Obi-Wan has demonstrated a bit of a blinkers problem when it comes to Anakin's mental health. If Anakin's full potential is unleashed, Plobity loses. The question becomes then, is this likely to happen? Answer, probably not. In contrast to the likes of Dooku, who uses Dunmok to draw out emotion in his opponents and undermine their focus, Plo Koon and Obi-Wan in particular prefer to focus their misdirection on their opponents' actual decision making, rather than the emotions behind them. They will affect false openings to draw their opponents into overextending. They won't hold out their arms with a smug smile to insult them. This may still yet backfire, as if they get the better of Kianikit without finishing them off, the intense frustration involved could be enough to force Anakin into the Avatar state, but we don't believe this likely. While the number of factors leaning in Plobity's favor heavily influences our conclusion, the number does not necessarily affect the outcome of these sorts of analyses. More important, particularly here, is the way each factor lines up against the other teams in terms of potential impact. And now for our narrative style verdict. Are you fucking kidding me? It took me two weeks to write the last one and that was just Bane and T fighting. And it was 26 minutes long. No sir, summary only. Okay, in very brief summary, we believe the fight would play out like this. Kianikit takes the initiative. Plobt cede it to them. Fight remains a saber one, Plobt's advantage not immediately apparent as they spend the early stages of the fight simply weathering the progressively advancing storm, planning their counter-offensive. T is controlling the initiative of the defensive team. Her ability to read all present through her sphere sense allowing for intuitive and immediate perception of any change in the flow of the fight. Her greater focus on speed and agility also allows her to maneuver into advantageous position to springboard the team's counteroffensive. She would likely lead with a powerful telekinetic blast, aiming to throw her opponents off balance and allow for a quick finish by Plo or Kenobi. Kianikit would be staggered, but none of them are going to be left exposed in this moment, merely halted. The teams would exchange blows on the spot, Plobity's counters holding the advantage with Kianikit's momentum arrested. 
Eventually, the offensively focused team is going to build back up, however, at which point the ever-mobile satellite of the defensive team, T, will flank and strike at the sides. Either Anakin or Kiadi, most likely Kiadi as he is less integral to the team's point offense, would break away and duel independently for a moment. Kit would use this opening to drive forward his assault and push closer to the edge with his Shicho barrage. His amped up state improving his ability to pressure the two, but also preventing Anakin from effectively levying his own onslaught. Plo and Obi-Wan would use Kit against him, and we believe this fatal overextension on the Nautilus' part would be his downfall. Either Obi or Plo could take Kit down, but it is more likely Plo that will strike the final blow, as Obi is better suited to tanking Kit's barrage than the Keldor, who himself is more proficient on the counteroffensive. With Kit dead, the wild card steps into the spotlight. We do not believe Anakin is likely to fully fall into his Avatar state, Kit is a professional peer and not someone he is particularly close to, and as mentioned previously, Ploby are not going to be smugly rubbing salt in the wound. That being said, he will be taking the fight to them from this point on. Anakin is not the type to take an ally's death in stride. He's going to be hammering them until they die or he does. The question becomes then, which fight ends first? Plo, Obis, and Anakin's, or Sharks and Kiadis? At first glance, you would think the 2v1 would be the swifter, but with Ploby's passive defensive approach, they are almost certainly going to fall back on the tactic of weathering Anakin's storm. In this eventuality, the fight is going to turn into a rolling bout of attrition. In the meanwhile, we have Blitzkrieg T versus Stoic Kiadi. Though their fight would not be a brief affair, Kiadi's straightforward methods really don't bring the kind of power one needs to break T in a head to head engagement. Sooner or later, she is going to outmaneuver the Syrian and cut him down. With Kiadi dispatched, T will be on Anakin within seconds, and at this point, the conclusion should be clear. Anakin's good, don't get us wrong, but even if he managed to somehow tap into his true force potential as he did against Dooku, there is no way that this would be enough to take on three near-Dooku-level opponents. At least not without an obscenely powerful blast of force power previously unseen in the lightsaber-centric Chosen One. Anakin would join his companions on the floor in short order. We declare Team Ploby T the victors. As always, this is just our opinion. We hope you enjoyed our analysis, even if you disagree with the outcome. Thank you all so much for your support this season, and I assure you Season 7 is just around the corner. Thank you to Jen Sarai and Ready4 for joining me for this collaboration, and I'll see you guys later.